Hi everyone, my name is Shelby and you're watching Read and Find Out. So today I'm going to be doing a review and then a discussion of the third book in the Stormlight Archive, Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. I'm putting this down now because it's really heavy. So the first part of this video is going to be a spoiler free review of Oathbringer, but it will probably include spoilers for the first two books in the Stormlight Archive. And then the second part of it will be more of a discussion where I get into some spoilery thoughts. So let's jump right in with the review. Oathbringer is picking up where Words of Radiance left off with Kaladin going off to see his parents and to inform them about like the Everstorm and everything, and Shallan and Dalinar being in Erythiru. I'm not going to say too much about the plot other than that because I don't want to spoil anything else, just know that's where the book is picking up. I'm going to start by talking about things that I particularly liked, then I'll move into things that I didn't like, and then my star rating. So as per usual, I loved Kaladin's arc in this story, even though there was a lot less actual character development on his side because he's not the focus of this book. But because I love Kaladin as a character, I just thought that what we did get of him was very strong. In this book I also really liked how the general past of the Knights Radiant and of the world of Urshar is explored. So we get some answers about things that have happened in the past, and really the history of the world. So that's something that you get some good insight on without saying anything about what you learn. It just makes a lot more sense of the current climate of the story. I think this book also really shines with some of the more secondary characters. So some of the not main point of view characters like Zeth or Lyft, those sections are just really, really interesting. And it's nice to kind of tie in more parts of the story that before were kind of separate pieces. Also, I feel like you're learning a lot more about the Cosmere in this book, and there are some inter-Cosmere kind of tie-ins. So though I don't think it's going to be totally necessary to know everything about Brandon Sanderson's wider Cosmere universe, it's going to help make sense of a lot more things as you go on in the Stormlight Archive from here out. I liked making these connections of like how things was, were working, and once I've finished reading the published works in the Cosmere, I probably am going to do like a, like an introduction to the Cosmere sort of video, but that's like months down the road. Just a heads up. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I disliked non-spoilery now, because there were quite a few things. Shallan really bothered me in this book. That's pretty much all I can say without getting into spoilers, but as she is one of the main point of view characters, it kind of sucked <laughs> that I really wasn't feeling her in this book. There's also the fact that this book is focusing on Dalinar, and Dalinar was actually the least interesting of the three main characters so far, in my opinion, in the first two books. So when we got to this book, though I was interested in the backstory, kind of on an intellectual level. I wasn't super invested on an emotional level. Also the fact that we've always been told in the first couple of books that Dalinar has this sinister reputation and everything as being really violent. And just as somebody who's not a big fan of violence and war and stuff, seeing that in some of these flashbacks and backstory wasn't my thing exactly though it did make sense of a lot of what we had heard of Dalinar. And then just for the general book, I thought this was kind of all over the place. Though there were consistent things happening throughout the story, or like recurring issues, you could say, I'm still not entirely sure what the point of this book was, and what its place is in the story as a whole. I also have no idea where the story is going to go from here, because at the end of the book I didn't think there was an obvious jumping off point for the next book. So at this point I I'm kind of confused about where Sanderson is taking the Stormlight Archive, because I think for the first two books I thought I had an idea, and now I... I don't know. Also, as someone who's very curious, though we learned a lot about the past and the history of Roshar, we did not learn as much about the Knights Radiant specifically in their present form the way that I hoped that we would. Honestly, I wanted to know so much about Surge Binding and the different orders in Spren, and I just have so many questions that weren't answered. And there are things that I think you could easily have worked into this instead of making it seem like you're just going to be drip-fed for the sake of being drip-fed. I understand not wanting to give us everything right away, but there have been three 1200-page books, I mean, come on. I want a little bit more information 
about these ten orders of the Knights Radiant and their spren and how exactly they work. But anyway, as for a star rating, I gave this four stars because I did enjoy it. I think part of the reason I enjoyed it enough for a four star rating is because this is Sanderson's Cosmere and it's Stormlight and Roshar and it's my favorite part of his Cosmere work. I just like being with the story and the world and these characters and this magic system. So that pretty much on its own was enough for me to give it a four star rating. I thought I was frustrated with things with the pacing in the first book and I gave that one a 4.25 star. And then in Words of Radiance, I gave it a 5 star because honestly I think that one was close to perfection. So this one, maybe it's just that I went in with really high expectations after Words of Radiance and having so many questions that I wanted answered, but I was a bit let down. But still, I really liked it and I gave it 4 stars. Now I'm going to be getting into the spoilery section, so I'm going to be doing spoilery likes and dislikes. So if you haven't actually read Oathbringer yet, so for things that I liked, I love Kaladin. I love Kaladin so much. Kaladin and the Parchman and his thoughts about what is ethical and them not even really being the bad guys I loved very very much because throughout most of this book I just felt really bad for the Parchman. Also the fact that the humans are really the Voidbringers because the Parchman were here first. I wasn't exactly surprised actually because I thought it made a lot of sense but at the same time it was really neat to see that it actually like bothered them and changed the way they viewed things a little bit when they realized oh we were the invaders. I just thought it was really interesting bringing in this idea of whose land is this anyway and like who gets to decide that and how are they going to work this out now that they're all there because I mean the parchment are kind of justified in wanting their lives back. But also you don't want to just like exterminate all the people like what do you do with this? And the freaking void spread, like, I don't like them, I don't like that, I don't know what to do with all of this. And Odium, like, is he, he's bad, right? Like, he's definitely bad, but he's also a shard, and can shards really be bad? Are they, or, like, are they just balance? I don't know, I don't know. I also really loved that we got to go to Shadesmore in this, like, for an extended period of the book, like, almost a full part or something. Shadesmar is the cognitive realm, and I think it's even referred to as the cognitive realm at some point in the book. So you're definitely making some Cosmere ties, because there's a cognitive and a spiritual and a physical realm in all of the Cosmere worlds, and it's something that ties them together. But there's the whole world hopping, using perpendicularities. The word perpendicularities was in part four of this. Holy crap. But world hopping in the cognitive realm, and hoid, and... I guess we met more world hoppers, like, I need to know more about this. Speaking of Shadesmar in the Cognitive Realm, Adolin's sword! When they first showed up in Shadesmar, I was like, wait, does Azor have a sprint that I didn't know about? Is it like kind of a sprint from a different world and that's why her eyes are like scratched out? No, it's Adolin's dead sword! How cool is that? Not cool, because like it's really sad that he's essentially lugging around a spren corpse. But also, like, I think they are more bonded for her to be dead, so she's kind of not dead in some way. Like when Adolin was being attacked once, and then his sword jumped on top of the thing that was attacking him. <laughs> that was really sweet. And that he's just, like, always kind of consciously looking for her when they're in Shadesmar. I appreciated that. I don't know. We've been kind of talking about the end of the book, so towards the very end, Queen Yasna. I'm so excited that Yasna is like this heretic queen. <laughs> like, she'll show the Alethi that her uncle's not crazy. Not that they've had any respect for her and her beliefs this entire time, but maybe being queen will change that. Then there were some really interesting secondary character perspectives, and we got to actually see secondary characters interacting with main point of view characters, and it was great. So I'm going to be really interested in Vinley's storyline going on, and I'm really hoping that she and Dalinar or Renarin, I have a thought about that, I'm hoping that they can somehow form some sort of pact between the Knights Radiant and whatever the equivalent is, and I'm hoping they can work together. And I think that Vinley and Renarin are a good way to do that. 
because I'm pretty sure Venli has bonded a spren that's like a normal spren, like a people spren. And Renarin has apparently bonded a corrupted spren, though I don't even know what that means, which bothers me. It bothers me so much, but I'm gonna get into that in dislikes. I love seeing Zeth and Lyft in the same setting for some reason. I think they're so cute. <laughs> Ever since Edge Dancer. I think Lyft is gonna be a boss, though in the later books. Like, I'm excited to see her progress. And then I'm gonna end on the likes talking about Renarin, because Renarin I both like and dislike what happened with him in this book, because I'm just really confused. I'm really interested personally in the Order of the Truth Watchers, because that since book one, before I even really knew what was going on, I was like, well, if I was a Knight's Radiant, I would be a Truth Watcher. So I was really hoping to get some answers, and then it turns out that Renarin's not even really a truth watcher. Or maybe he is. Does bonding a corrupted spren mean you're not really a knight's radiant? Like, what qualifies you as a knight radiant? Can you only be bonded to specific spren? What does corrupted even mean? What kind of spren is Glyce or Gliss or however you say his name? Like, what kind of spren is he actually other than that he's corrupted? Like, is he a corrupted spren of whatever the truth watchers were? And does that mean that Renarin is still a truth watcher? Because he obviously still has the surges of healing, regrowth, or regeneration, or whatever it's called. Also, Yasna was gonna kill him? What the heck? I think that's a little bit extreme. <laughs> Even if he's bonded a corrupted sprint, I don't think that makes him a traitor, because what does corruption even really mean? Like, isn't it kind of relative to your perception of normality with Spren bonding? Like, what? I don't think it's something worthy of him being like, killed over. Also, when I was reading part 3 or 4, whenever it was that the intro with the little segments from the gemstones, it was pretty obvious, or at least to me, that the different gemstones were representing the different orders of the Knights Radiant. Like the sapphire gemstones would contain messages from the Windrunners, or the emerald ones would contain messages from like truth watchers in the past. But the one little clip that said something along the lines of, don't tell anyone. I foresaw this, was from a truth watcher. Now we have been thinking that Renarin is a truth watcher, but we also knew that Renarin to some degree was able to see bits of the future. But then it's always said that seeing the future is of odium. So are different orders potentially aligned with different shards? Because we know that, for example, the Windrunners bond honor spren. A lot of the orders we don't know the kind of spren that they bond yet. But I'm pretty sure that for the Edge Dancers, Wendell is a cultivation spren. So we know that there are spren that are associated with different shards. So is it possible that Truth Watchers are associated with the shard that is Odium? But we do know that two people who have been called Truth Watchers had some sort of foresight ability. And we know that that has traditionally been linked to Odium. So perhaps even if Truth Watchers aren't inherently of the shard Odium, maybe they became corrupted in some sense? Since that one record says something like, don't tell anyone, I foresaw this. As if it was secretive or something that was like creeping in. Anyway, that's all just speculation, probably me overthinking things, but maybe making connections that could be relevant for future books. So piggybacking off of Renarin, we're going into the parts of the book that I disliked. Why did they have to do that about Renarin? Was it really necessary? I guess I don't know what the plot is of this overarching like 10 book series, so maybe at the moment it just feels like it's unnecessary, but I just don't know where this is gonna go, or like I've said already, I don't know where the story's even gonna go. Though apparently something important revolves around Renarin. I don't know. We'll see. Talking more about characters, I mentioned Shalban drove me crazy in this. I thought a lot of this like multiple identities stuff seemed really forced. I understand that she's kind of having to come to grips with a lot of different parts of her personality at this point because she is accepting truths about herself. There are times where I was just like, Shalon, get it together. Like, this doesn't make any sense. I talked about liking and disliking Dalinar's backstory. I think it didn't make sense to put it in here because it almost seems like something that should have been like built in the first book. Because this seemed almost like deconstructing this character that we already really liked which was an interesting thing for Sanderson to do, but I don't know how effective it was. I think that I don't like Dalinar as much as a person anymore because it's just hard to like him 
when you know how many children's deaths he is responsible for, for example, or just people in general. Then there's the whole Adolin resolution, which I just thought that was glossed over, and I thought that it would be a much bigger part of the book than it turned out to be based on the ending of the last one, especially when Adolin decides to tell Dalinar at the end that he killed Sadius and it's just kind of like thrown in there. Oh, okay, we talked about it for like less than a page. So I don't know if that's going to continue to come up in other books, but I think it should because it was kind of a big deal. Speaking of things that were glossed over, there's Eshenai's death, and I thought Eshenai was going to become a big part of the plot starting in this book. And then we just find out she's dead. We don't even see her death or anything. We just see her dead body. Which part of me is thinking, oh, is she really dead? But I would kind of like to just be able to assume she's dead since we saw her corpse. And I know maybe Venli is kind of replacing her in that now, but I was kind of attached to Ash and I from the first book, and I wasn't a huge fan of Venli. And I've already talked about how I just thought this book was kind of scrambled and kind of all over the place. There are pacing issues for the first three parts. And it seemed almost like this was just kind of a filler book where not a ton really happens, at least in the whole scheme of things. But like I said, I still did enjoy it because I just love the Stormlight Archive, and I gave it four stars because I liked it, but I couldn't give it more than that because that really would have been pushing it for me as far as my enjoyment. I just wanted to learn more about the different orders and their sprint and how their surges work for each specific order. Like, I just didn't get the answers that I wanted which is something that I feel like we're just being teased with for some people at this point. Like Yasna. Yasna is an else caller. Why don't we just get answers to that? Because she's somebody that we know and know pretty well. That was another thing about Renarin, or Renarin's story part, that I wasn't a huge fan of because I was like, okay, we know he's a truth watcher, why don't you just tell us the stuff about the truth watchers? It just seems kind of like wanting to have all the information and just like slowly dole it out. And I'm way too curious for that at this point because these books are really freaking long, and there are years between each of them being released, so. Anyway, that is going to be it for this video. Comment down below and let me know what you thought of Oathbringer and what you think of the Stormlight Archive. Thank you for watching, I hope you have a good day, and until next time, bye.